Good morning! I'm Polarized Moon, and welcome back to RuneScape. So I've got all of these engrams to give to Orla. Uh, I've charged this engram with divine energy and some memory strands. Could you take a look at it? This is perfect. I can feel the energies of the past reading from this engram. I will add the echo to the pool and harness its power for you. For free, of course, though I wouldn't mind a pat on the back every now and then. That wasn't the only charged engram I have. Oh, someone's been busy. Your reputation for getting things done is clearly not unfounded. I'll take you- I'll take any more you have and add them to the pool. Whoa! Oh, that was awesome! That was, like, that was a hundred thousand experience! Oh, wow! Fantastic! If I do that just a couple more times, I'll totally have- Wow. Uh, alright. So... So now I can go see what all these are. So I can add them all to this and then learn about the stuff. And then I can... And then I can prestige, and then I can give her these memory strands. And that gives me also extra experience. Um... Fairy. Talk to the Echo. There was a moon, close to a lush-looking planet, whose tiny winged inhabitants opened portals to explore the wonders of the universe. This is their story. I discovered my first evidence of the race I would come to know as the fairies in my exploration of the myriad nature worlds. And their environments of wild diversity, prolific with the strangest of fauna and flora, where the strongest survived and the weak were food. Much later, similar creatures were found on Gilinor, such as the Jadinko and the Gan... Gan... Adermic beasts with an incredibly, undeniably common origin. They were perhaps the final products of a great experiment. Could the same hand have forged the blade that I wield? On one dark world teeming with all manner of fungi in its humid jungles and moist swamps, I met with a race of surprisingly intellectual mushrooms. They lacked mobility, but traveled far and distributed by diversing, diversing spores that fused with the nervous system of local animals, allowing them to control the host. Bonding with me in this way, I was able to communicate with the my myceloids. Friendly though they were, I took much pres persuasion to convince the symbiotic parasites to detach from my brain upon taking root. Another world teemed with insects, a culture of winged invertebrates that bore some resemblance to the fairies of Xenaris, but swarms were mindless and tirelessly in industrious. The migration of these insects, which was achieved through innate ability to teleport over short distances, also seemed to have a direct impact on the local climate, for reasons I could not discern. This brings me to the moon of Xenaris, the dark, magical forest, giant fungi, and, as I discovered on a return visit, a network of fairy rings they had made from the world gate I'd placed there. The fairies of Xenaris, caretakers of the world below, obviously shared a common ancestry with the creatures I had encountered on nature worlds. However, they were changed, transcendent, inexplicably bound to the abundant magical energy of Gilinar in order to fill a specific purpose. Xenaris is actually the moon of RuneScape, the moon of Gilinar. So if I if I pull up one of the nighttime, if I pull up one of the nighttime uh, skyboxes and pull my camera up, you'll see Xenaris. Um, the fairies are embodiment of magic; their life force infused with the anima. This is why they work so tirelessly to maintain Gilinor's weather and seasons, for the planet's equilibrium is intrinsic to their own well-being. They have no choice. It is now necessary for their very survival, but they perform their duty without complaint. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I want to learn about all these things, so let's put another one up here. So I have, like, a bunch of these to learn now. Alright, what do we got here? Uh, a gnome. Oh, these are really cool. I love this. This is so awesome. Talk to the Echo. Argento was the first of them, and it was the gnomes who found a proper home for him. Like all his kind, he was planted when the enemy of Monday was so very strong. He was there at the start, the time the first colonization, and while all else changed, he remained. When the gnomes deserted the surface, wandering and carving their way deep beneath the surface of this world, he remained. The gnomes left their camps behind them to be reclaimed by flora and fauna alike. The gods struck blow after blow against each other, rendering, churning, crushing the very rocks and soil of our homes. They almost destroyed our world, but he remained. When I stopped the wars, I was woken from my slumber and could no longer tolerate their petty rivalries, and forced the gods to cease their arguing and depart from my world. He remained. He was my friend. I had spent hours at a time sitting talking to him. 
He understood more about the animal Mundi than most anyone here, trapped into it as he was. He felt very every heble heble. Shush, I can read. He felt every ebb and flow, every rise and fall, like a pulse. So much time spent in conversation that I confided much in him. I shared my past as I could not with so many others. When there, when wars were done, I went again to see him, surprised to know he still survived. But the horrors he had lived through, the suffering he had witnessed, such pain, such anguish, it was not who he had been, a shadow of himself. I could not let that be. We spoke a final time, and I reminded him of the friendship we had shared and the, what it had meant to me. I whispered soothing words, calming conversation that restored at least his peace of mind. He smiled. I opened the channel to him, and granted him a greater power that swelled his life energy. He would live long after I said goodbye to him so that he might watch over the gnomes who had given him his home. As the power flowed through his spirit, the spark drew his color from him, leaving him unique among his kind. That was not all it took from him. My gift also removed many of his memories, not least all the pain and trauma the God Wars laid upon him. It also purged our time together from his mind, robbing us of the basis of our friendship. So much of our shared history. For Argento's sake, there was a price to pay, and this was it. I lost my friend, but took his suffering from him. Aww, that's so sad. How many more of these do I have? Okay, so I can put them- I can put some back up here. So it looks like I've got six, seven, eight left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. The World Gate. Oh, that's so cool. Talk to the Echo. I had broken the blade, and for all my efforts I could not repair the damage I had wrought. Malicious entities poured forth from the perceived void in the torrential swarm. I enlisted allies to stem the tide and, and grieve for each that fell before their fangs and tentacles. I was reminded of something Sir Doman once told me. That he never desired war, but he must fight to preserve peace. If I do not stand before the swarm, it will consume us. Some must die so that all can live. Sacrifices must be made for the greater good. Now those I swore to protect die in my name. They suffer my mistake. It is a painful lesson, the kind of knowledge that forever changes one's ideals. I am finally beginning to understand the necessity of what happened on... Nar... Naragun? Naragun? I don't know how to say that word. My destruction of the blade brought an adept end to my lone exploration of the cosmos. But I had a new purpose. By manipulating the stone of power I found on Gilinor, I molded many of the broken blade's fragments into gateways, portals, which... The mortal life could travel to my perfect world and share in its beauty. I also established a gate on Xenaris, but it is prone to instability, its power leaking and ebbing. I have yet to determine the cause. It could be connected to the nexus of dimensional conduits I triggered with the blade. Or perhaps the fairy's innate ability to teleport between realms to carry out our seasonal duties affects other forms of teleportation. I hope it is not a product of outside influence. Uh, the druids. There we go. Oh, that is so cool. Oh, I love that. I love this so much. Talk to the Echo. <clears throat> when they first came to me, I knew not what to do with them. But they came with open hands, minds, and hearts. I could not reject their approach with callous ignorance. And so I spoke to them. I spoke of them who would come and who would listen. Some did not understand that I eschewed their worship. That I did not want such sacred reverence from them. They angered me with their pr naive praise and lack of autonomy. But others listened. I always hoped they might. There were two who were core to those who tried to understand what I taught. Snicks and Snacks. An insightful, challenging young woman and her vibrantly enthusiastic younger brother. The frown on their faces as they engaged with my thoughts and the discussion that came from it sometimes was their words or questions were like a battle. There were long hours spent with words thrown back and forth between us and the others sat in a circle we formed. They did not simply listen to my words and throw constant praise at me. Instead, they asked me questions that forced me to examine my own thoughts on the philosophies I carried with me. They did not change what I thought, but their insightful efforts deepened my own understanding and reinforced my wish not to be worshipped. There was a friendship of sorts present, but that could never be. Snicks would force me to consider the very essence of balance, 
the harmony of freedom I wanted for all life, the ability to live freely with all around you. The best expressions of my own understanding were formed in these moments. Snacks in turn reminded me of the effervescent nature of life itself, the joy in the worlds around us and why my ideology was so important. There was Snicks, where Snicks th thought Snacks was passion. In a way, I loved them both. For years after their passing, I mourned them in a way I had mourned no others before them. They were the first of the druids, and I thank them for understanding what I wanted so much better than so many others. I cannot be worshipped. I want people my I want people to follow my example, balance, harmony, freedom, all entwined for the good of all. Wow, that's that's deep. Holy crap. Alright, let's get let's get, ah, itchy nose. Let's get some more up in here. Uh the stone of jazz. I have I have <laughs> I have an over a cosmetic override called Jazz Hands. <laughs> where it's the stone of jazz on your hands. On each hand, it, it's pretty funny. Ah, the stone. Known by many names, including much to my discomfort, the Fist of Guthics. Its ancient power has opened up boundless potential, and the lust for that power has irrevoc irrevocably scarred this perfect world. The races I had fought, I had brought to Gilanor have fought, died, and longed for it. I set in these events in motion, inciting millennia of conflict and death. I hold myself accountable for these atrocities. I sought to share its power with mortals. They might not be subjugated by the gods, but they left their gods behind, attached, attached, attracted, shush, I can read, attracted by the potential magic. I distilled the stone's essence into runic magic, stones of power, but the discovery of magic spells I left in the hands of those that followed me to Kilinor. The diversity of magical eff effects they achieved was inspiring, though many sought mastery of only the basest elements, drawing on them for raw offensive power. I should have seen this as a sign of things to come, but I hoped that at free reign they might see harmful impact for themselves, and gain enlightenment from their destructive impulses. Alas, the colonists returned to me, empty-handed and hungry for more power, their desire for rune stones almost an addiction. Reluctantly, I thought sought to indulge them, but I sensed within the stone a growing peasant's anger, violent rage. It grew as I drew power from the stone, and I feared that this terrible ferocity might be unleashed. I realized that I had abused the stone's power too long, and the consequences if I pursued would be grave, so I hid the stone for our own protection. My refusal was poorly received, some turned to desperate worship, others to violence over jealousy hoarded of the rune stones. Now a precious commodity stained in spilt blood. In retrospect, I was motivated by cowardice and fatigue, but it was at this time that I withdrew into slumber. I hoped that, should I awake, I might bear witness to a more civilized age. That time did not come. Wow. Oh, there's so much, like, deep thought here. Sheep! <laughs> talk to the Echo. I'm gonna talk to sheep. I respect the sheep, bar none, for their purpose is essential, albeit secret. Where there is wool, there is a way. <laughs> Someday you two might endeavor to discover the true power of the sheep, innocent in appearance, but essential in bearing. Sheep are under my protection. Harm them at your peril, or you shall pay for your transgression. I shall not tolerate such sheer audacity. Allow me to ram this point home. Watch out for sheep with webbed feet. They are mutton but trouble, and more cunning than they look. Though I cannot, though if you cannot beat them, join them, or bleed them. Oh my gosh, that was just full of puns. I love that. Found in a pen protected by the thing. Found where the bug guards impact from a fist. Oh yeah, okay. Mixed cakes near a stone circle. Okay. Time. So this is time itself? Oh, okay. Talk to the Echo. It cannot be true, for... This is not how it will end. I am a god. I am not subject to the mortal cycle, like those I loved. What he told me cannot be true. How can they even... How are they even who they claim to be? This is not something that should be. How can they come here and tell me things I cannot know? It must be a lie. Where did they get this key that unlocks such a journey? It cannot be the truth of this world. I made this place what it is. My time cannot be done. Why me? Why now? Why have I given so much of myself to this place, and this is how I am repaid? This is the sacrifice that they asked of me? 
How can this happen to me? How can this happen to me? <laughs> uh, why would this be my fate? <laughs> I who have slept rather than bring suffering to people. Who has not demanded worship but avoided furthering such practices. And now no t my time has come and I will be no more. This cannot be right. This cannot be just. Where is the balance in this? Where is my own freedom? Why should I pay this cost? What if I made a different offer to them? Is there a negotiation to this? A path to truer harmony? Perhaps there is a different path from the one I have tried to follow. which One which leaves me to a different fate. What if where I find this person again, before my time has come, what would it take for them to change their part in what is going to happen? No more of this eternal life, a death to come, onslaught when it comes. Why could it not have come long ago, before all this? Before the eons that have passed since I last saw her. My beautiful Aggie. How can it be now it happens? And oh my daughter, I have missed you, an empty heart for you still. I had almost forgotten in my rage how long I have lost you. How much I wish I was with you. Your smile. I gave no hope to ever see it again. I will be gone as you both are. I am lost. So it is come. So it is to come. I can see that now. They have the... Uh, they have the... Amsurdwis. I don't know what that is. It must be true. He will be my friend. It is not a fight I can win or one I ho wish to. Instead, I must accept what is to come. The time has come to prepare for my own end. But I cannot let this be world be exposed to the horrors of others. Should I should I would release, unleash upon it. The guardians must be in place. He who told me what is to come will be the one who completes them. They will serve me as I have served their people. And they in turn will come to see me again as tell, tell me of what will pass. They will always remember their purpose, and I will always remember mine. So, um, I know that later on in the story, our character becomes the World Guardian, the one that he's talking about. So we're the one that he puts in place to protect the the world after he's gone. Um, and that's all after... That, that's when the age, the age changes from the 5th age to the 6th age. Um, so you can actually see that during this. The, uh, um, yeah, when they, when they have this kind of stuff here. This is, this is the 6th age... And then you've got the 5th Age ones here. Um, so all the 5th Age ones happen in the past of what's going on now. Which is really cool, I, I, I think. The Sword of Edicts. So I believe this is the giant... This is the sword that's the giant sword that's out in the wilderness. That huge one. Talk to the Echo. What do we got here? Ag agony, suffering, anguish, misery, sor sorrow, and death. The pain ripped through my body as a, as like liquid fire, rendering a terrible wound in the earth. I had never imagined such pain, an ordeal without end, a nightmare from which I would not awake. My soul was bound to Gielinor, and the tether blazed with searing torment. I suffered the world- if I suffered, the world suffered. No. I suffered as the world suffered, trapped in a prison of my own making. A prison of flesh and soil and eternal slumber, just as I had sought. I do not know how long I rocked and screamed and wailed. I did not expect to hear any to hear my cries, nor did I want to be found. My torment ceased as suddenly as it began. At first, I thought what sweet oblivion had claimed me and finally brought an end to my agony. I realized my eyes were open. My vision cleared. I saw four tiny figures surrounding me, dressed in robes of my color. Ah, if she knows. The air was befouled by the smell of burnt sacrifices. The four druids bowed bef down before me, chanting in a familiar tongue, drawing in the power of the elements to stabilize me. Later I learned their names, Rhea, Atru, Reef, and Thera. They pledged their lives to me. I entreated them to cease their worship, but they would not be discouraged. Their sleeping god had arisen, and they reveled in the throes of adoration. I gazed down at my wounded body as my connection to the soil faded. The wound that tore across my chest had already begun to heal. I blinked, and I was on the surface of Gilinor. The world was on fire. The stone. They had used the stone. Not to create, but to destroy. And the nightmarish, the nightmares that had plagued me, of death and battle and strife, that I had prayed were only dreams, 
were made flesh, worse than I could have imagined. Millennia of conflict, mortal lives ground beneath the war machine of avarice and ambition. The world burned because I chose to tolerate their greed. Gilinor suffered for my cowardice. I could no longer hide from my duty to this world. Hoping to maintain a neutral equilibrium, I was forced to take action. The Age of the Gods had reached its end. Alright, so they forced him awake. Guardians of Guthix. Oh! It's the, the snake. Hello. Before I settled to rest, I walked among many creatures and sought each of those who were my guardians. I found each. I asked but one question. I knew their service would be lifetimes to come, eons of time. And should I recognize their service to the world and myself? So I asked, what gift can I leave to you? I came to Juna first, or er, last. Faithful Ju June is the snake, whose egg I saved as last of her kind. So long ago, her world now just a place of only death. She who only knew Galenor and loved this world so much as I. And as I asked the others, I asked her too. The others had asked for treasures, favors, powers, or artifacts that they wanted or needed for what they thought they might face. I knew that Juna would not be one of those. I was not wrong in this assessment. She lived up to everything I had hoped for her. For a moment, she caught my eye, before lowering her head. Her eyes welled up with tears when she pondered the answer we both knew was deep within her heart. At last she whispered it, as much hissed as spoken. Stay with us. It was a pure expression of what she felt, and I knew it to, I knew it to be all she desired that she knew she had no right to ask of it for me, her god, and that I could never grant such a thing for her or the others. It was a thing we all knew I could not be asked of me. Her eyes would not meet mine. She was clearly ashamed to ask it. Oh, this is actually really sad. Whew. I reached out to her, placed my hand upon the top of her head, and she looked at me and smiled at her. For in that moment, I knew my, my gift to her, and it was the greatest of my gifts. The world is yours now, Juna. Yours forever, free from the manipulation of the gods. This is my first gift, but you deserve another. For in my own eyes, tears had formed too. One rolled down my cheek. I spoke again. I give you my tears. And in those tears you know that I am ever living. And that I am with you. And that I weep to be apart from you. I lifted my hand at last, and the tear fell from my jaw and landed on the floor below Juna. But I could not stay, nor mourn, for the time had come for me to leave. I knew she would think my greatest gift was in the tears, but she would be wrong. Freedom is the greatest gift, and so easily forgotten. So that's the Tears of Guthix. The It's a cave underneath, um... I, I've done this before, I've done that in this series. But it's a cave underneath Lumbridge. There's actually just a cave that cries. And she guards the the cave, and the cave gives brings balance. So that's what that is. All right. Well, either way, that's all the time I've got for this episode. Like and subscribe if you like the episode. Ring that bell if you like to see more. Good night. I'm going to do this more tomorrow. Actually, I'm just going to add this last one here. Um. There we go. Whoa, that's creepy looking. All right. So now I have all these in. I'm going to read this last one tomorrow, and then I'm going to ascend or what, what's it called? Prestige. And then we'll see how that goes. But I'm going to do that tomorrow. So, good night, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye!